my father. Again, it's a privilege and an honor to be up here. Um, it is humbling, Father. I pray that tonight as we look at a command that you've given us, I pray that um, we would obey that command. I pray that we would walk in your ways. And we thank you that you want to put us through trials to refine us. Help us to see them as blessings. Help us to count it all joy, which is not easy for us, Father. But we ask for your presence now. And we ask this in the name of Yeshua, your Son. Amen. Okay. So when you hear the word commandment, commandment, what comes to mind? Ten commandments. Okay, if you're like me, the first thing that comes, what's that? An order. An order. Okay, the first thing that comes to my mind is the ten happy laws that are known as the Ten Commandments. How about the word command? What comes to mind? What about in the English language, if you think of the word command? Okay, what, we'll do it now, okay. Maybe the order of a general or a lieutenant or a captain is a command. Um, maybe you question what command really means when it's spoken of in the Bible, maybe not. I wanna take a look at the definition of the word command. And if I mispronounce this, I am not a Greek or Hebrew scholar, so forgive me. But the word mitzvah, its primary meaning, the Hebrew word mitzvah, and I like this first part, so we're talking about the word command, can also mean commandment. It refers to the commandment commanded by God to be performed as a religious duty. So give me some leeway here, but according to this definition, it could be that command and commandment could be interchangeable. Is that a, a fair statement? Okay, so I want to look at a command today, a commandment that many of us tend to overlook. And I believe that probably most, if not all of us, have maybe never considered this as a commandment. Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. So if we look at this verse in its context, first we find out that there'd been a little tiff, a little disagreement between two sisters in the church at Philippi. And you know what? I am glad that they don't dig into what the argument was between these two sisters because we have a tendency of wanting to always know what other people's business is and it's better not to know that. But Paul's answer to this little tiff is rejoice in the Lord always. People who are very happy, especially those who are very happy in the Lord, usually won't be easily offended or offend others. Their minds are so sweetly occupied with the things of heaven that they are not easily distracted by the little troubles which will naturally arise amongst, amongst, um, bleh, tongue -tied here, among such imperfect creatures as we are. Joy in the Lord is the cure for all discord. Now notice that the apostle, after he had said, rejoice in the Lord always, he commanded the Philippians to be careful for nothing thus implying that the joy in the Lord is one of the best preparations for the trials of life. Let's read it together. So this follows, rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Be careful for how much? Nothing. Nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, it's my best favorite part there, we are to ask our supplications with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So the cure for care is joy in the Lord. Brothers, you won't be able to keep on with your worries. Any of you guys have any worries? Good. I see a lot of heads going like this. That's good. Sisters, you won't be able to wear yourself any longer with your anxieties. Any anxieties, ladies? <laughs> I heard some oh yes. Okay. If the Lord fills you with his joy, we don't need to worry about it. Then, when you're completely satisfied with your God and overflowing with delight in Him, you will say to yourself, Why art thou downcast, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him for the help of His countenance. What on this earth is worth fretting over? Even if you could get a fret, worry could get you a great imperial crown, all it would bring is more worry because you'd have to worry about the crown, right? Therefore, let us be thankful and let us be joyful in the Lord. It is one of the wisest things that by rejoicing in the Lord, 
we can have a little slice of heaven here on the earth below. It is possible to do so, it is profitable to do so, and we are commanded to do so. Let's revisit that text for the day. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So rejoice in the Lord, says the apostle. In the first place, this is an awesome thing. What a gracious God we serve, and he makes it a delight to be a duty and who commands us to rejoice. Shouldn't we be obedient to such a command as this? It is intended that we should be happy. That is the meaning of the precept, that we should be cheerful. More than that, we should be thankful, and more than that, we should rejoice. You cannot be too happy. You ever notice that some Christians think that uh, they've got to put ashes in their oatmeal? You know, that life has to be miserable if you're a good Christian? Have you ever ran into people like that? I have. Now, do not suspect yourself of being wrong because you're full of delight. Provided that it is joy in the Lord, you can have not too much of it. Joy speaks for itself. It's kind of like a candle in a dark room. You don't need to sound a trumpet and say, now light has come. The candle proclaims itself by its own brilliance. And I think I've seen this. When joy comes into a man, it shines out his eyes and shines out of his countenance. Do you agree with that? You ever been around people that the joy just exudes? There's something about every limb of the man that says, I belong to God. Jesus is my Savior, and I delight every day to be alive and to serve him. Joy, it refreshes the marrow of the bones, it quickens the flowing of the blood in the veins. Is it a healthy thing to be joyful? You're a nurse. Have you seen the difference? Those that have that... that that it's proven that prayer and a, and a spiritual life increases our health. When the Lord sends us affliction, do we generally grumble kind of loudly? Sometimes? When the Lord tries us, we generally are ready to tell anybody that wants to hear. Now, on the other hand, when the Lord multiplies his mercies to us, do we speak about it? Do we sing about it? Do we share that the Lord has been gracious like our sister just did? Praise God. In, tri in trials, you can rejoice. I can't remember, and maybe you can't either, ever seeing in the newspapers, hearing on the radio or on TV, articles or programs of thankfulness and expressions of delight about all the good and wonderful things happening in the world. What do we hear? Doom and gloom, right? Let us, as Christians be a modern-day media alternative. <laughs> when we're going through the grocery line, speak of the joys of the Lord. Talk of the positive, beautiful things about God and His creation. Here's a quote from Adventist Home on page 430. And they're on your handouts as well, if you can't see them up here. The true Christian will be cheerful. That's a good title. Do not allow the perplexities and worries of everyday life to fret your mind and cloud your brow. If you do, you will always have something to vex and annoy. Is that a true statement? I like this sentence, and that's why I've got it underlined here. Life is what we make it, and we shall find what we look for. And you know, this is just a, a rabbit trail here. We've always told our children, um, you know, if they were to go to college or go to school or whatever, you could send them to the most conservative Adventist or Christian school there ever, ever was, they're going to find what they're looking for. If we look for sadness and trouble, if we are in a frame of mind to magnify little difficulties, we shall find plenty of them to engross our thoughts and our conversation. Is that the truth? But if we look on the bright side of things, we shall find enough to make us cheerful and happy. And I love this one. If we give smiles, they will be returned to us. If we speak pleasant, cheerful words, they will be spoken to us again. Joy is a choice. What are you guys going to choose? It is up to each of us to decide. Who are you attracted to? Is it the grumbling complainer who loves to share in the misery of others? Or is, that, is it that person that radiates joy from the Lord and has to go nowhere to go but flow out to others around them? You know, we went to a church years ago and there was a lady, she always had a smile on her face, and she also always had 
something cheerful to say those around her. We found out, not from her, but from others, that she suffered from chronic pain. She was in constant pain, and her husband was basically bedridden, and she was his, her caregiver, and yet she always had something kind and nice and never complained about her situation. And there was another man that I went to church with years ago, and he'd been, he was fairly new to the church, and I asked him, how did you come to the church? And he explained to me that he was working at a place, and he had a lot of complainers that he worked with. But there was one guy that always had something good to say. If he was asked to do something, guess what? He actually did it. And if other guys were complaining about what was going on at the job, he was the one to always t speak positively of his bosses and his workers. Um, he just had a, you could see the joy of the Lord in him. And because of that, there was no expression of, you know, let me beat you over the head with the Bible. This other man could see, this guy's got something I want. And he asked him, why are you always so happy? And he was able to share the goodness of what the Lord had done in his life. And he ended up becoming a Christian and coming to church because of that. That's the kind of influence that we have. Every day, you and I, whether we like it or not, are telling a story. How we live our lives is an open book to our friends and our families and our coworkers and all we come into contact with. What does the story of your life tell others? It's important to contemplate. Have you ever heard the expression, we may be the only Bible that somebody ever reads? That's a very true statement. So let's get back to our verse. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, I want you to notice that this rejoicing is commanded. It is not a matter left to your opinion. It is not set before you as a desirable thing, which you can do without, but it is a positive precept of the Holy Spirit to all who are in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. We ought to obey the precept because joy in the Lord makes us like God. He is the happy God. You believe that? And he would have his people to be happy. Let the followers of Baal cut themselves and make hideous cries, but the servants of Jehovah may not resort to such things. Even if they fast, what are they supposed to do? Anoint your head with oil and wash your face. They appear not unto men to fast, for a joyous God desires a joyous people. Adventist Home, page 430. These quotes are, uh, they speak to me as well as anybody else. When Christians appear as gloomy and depressed as though they thought themselves friendless, they give what? A wrong impression of religion. In some cases, the idea has been entertained that cheerfulness is inconsistent with the dignity of Christian character. But this is a... Mistake. Heaven is some joy. All. All joy. And if we gather together our souls, the joys of heaven, and as far as possible, express them in our words and our deportment, we shall be more pleasing to our heavenly Father than if we were gloomy and sad. You are commanded to rejoice because this is for your good. Holy joy will oil the wheels of life's machinery. Holy joy will strengthen you for your daily, daily labor. Holy joy will beautify you, and as I already said, give you an influence over the lives of others. It is upon this point that I want to insist most of all. We are commanded to rejoice in the Lord. If you cannot speak the gospel, live the gospel by your cheerfulness. I do believe that a man of God, listen to this, under trial and difficulty and affliction, bearing up, and patiently submitting and still rejoicing in God is the real preacher of the gospel. Preaching with an eloquence which is mightier than words can ever be and which will find its way into the hearts of those who might have resisted other arguments. It's like our testimony. Nobody can argue with our testimony. In other words, your life will speak volumes more many times than any sermon that can be preached to some people who will come into your life that will never set foot into a church. So let your life speak joy because no one can argue with that. Now, I want to break down another part. Rejoice what? In the Lord. Notice the sphere of this joy. It is in the Lord. We read in scriptures that children are to obey their parents in the Lord. We read that men and women being married only in the Lord. No child of God must go outside of that ring. This is where you are, where you ought to be, where you must be. You cannot truly rejoice 
if you get outside of in the Lord. Therefore, you should not do anything that is not in the Lord. Seek no joy which is not joy in the Lord. If you go after the poisonous sweets of this world, woe be to you and to me. Never rejoice in that which is sinful. For all such rejoicing is evil. Flee from it because it can do no good. That joy which cannot share with God is not the right joy for you. And we've talked about that this week. If we can't invite God into whatever we're doing, watching, seeing, listening to, etc., that is not in the Lord. In the Lord is the sphere of our joy. So what are some of the world's ways of telling us that we obtain joy? The biggest house, the nicest car, pornography, the latest fashion, food, money, that other man, that other woman, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These things will leave you empty and destroy you. Every one of these things will eventually be cast into a lake of fire along with those who decide to make these their source of joy. If your joy is not in the Lord, beware of where your loyalty really lies. Rejoice in the one God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. In him delight yourselves as it is written in Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. We cannot have too much of this joy in the Lord, for the great Jehovah is our exceeding joy. Or, let's change this a little bit. If in the Lord is meant the Lord Jesus, then let me invite you and persuade you and command you to delight in the Lord Jesus, incarnate in your flesh, dead for your sins, risen for your justification, gone into glory claiming victory for you, sitting at the right hand of God interceding for you, reigning all the worlds on your behalf, and soon to come to take you to his glory that you might be with him forever. Rejoice in the Lord Jesus. This is the sea of delight. Blessed are they that dive into its depths. There are times when you cannot rejoice in anything else, but you can rejoice in the Lord. Then rejoice him into the full. Do not rejoice in your temporal prosperity, for riches take wings and fly away. Do you believe that? Do not even rejoice. This is an interesting thought. Don't even rejoice in your great successes in the work of God. Did you hear that? Don't even rejoice in your great successes for the work of, in the work of God. Let me repeat that again. Don't be rejoicing in the works that God has worked through you. And let me explain that. If the Lord gives you success in the work, aren't we to rejoice? Remember how the 70 disciples came back to Jesus and said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. What did he answer? He said, notwithstanding, in this rejoice not. But the spirits are subject even unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Did you see that? Rejoice because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son is what our joy comes from. That is our source of joy, not because of what God has done for us or even through us, but simply of who God is. He is love, he loves you, and wants to adopt you if you'll let him. That's our joy. The third point I would like to expound from this text is this. Think of the time appointed for rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord. Everybody's so quiet. I think everybody's sleepy. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. always. When does always begin? Right? When does, joy, when does always begin? Huh? I heard it over here. Right now. Right? It's always. Right now. Let us begin to jo rejoice in the Lord right now. If any of you have taken a gloomy view of religion... I beseech you to throw that gloomy view out at once. Rejoice in the Lord, Lord always, and that means right now. So when are we to be glad? Rejoice in the Lord always. That is when you cannot rejoice in anything or anyone but God. When the fig tree does not blossom. Got some farmers out here, right? 
Andrew's shaking his head. When the fig tree doesn't blossom, when there's no fruit on the vine and no herd in the stall, when everything withers and decays and perishes, when the worm at the root of the gourd has made it to die, then rejoice in the Lord. When the day darkens into evening and the evening into midnight and the midnight into sevenfold horror of great darkness, rejoice in the Lord. And when that darkness does not clear but becomes more dense, when night comes after night and neither sun nor moon nor stars appear, still rejoice in the Lord always. Who uttered these words? Does anybody know? Who wrote this? Paul, oh, thank you. He's the one that uttered these words, had been a night and a day floating in the sea after a shipwreck. He had been stoned. He had suffered from false brethren. He had been in peril of his life. And yet, most fittingly, do those lips cry out to us, rejoice in the Lord always. At the stake itself, martyrs have fulfilled this word. I just, I can't imagine as they were being burned alive, they were singing hymns. Man, I hope that we have that possibility. I hope we have that strength. I think it was, I could be wrong on who it was. It was a former uh, Wycliffe, and he said, um, one of his partners asked him, do you think you're ready for, uh, to suffer persecution? He goes, I don't know if I'm ready or not, but I hope the Lord gives me the strength when the time comes. We don't know, but that starts today. We have to give them everything today so tomorrow we'll have that extra strength that we need. But also take care that you rejoice in the Lord when you have other things to rejoice in. What do I mean? When he loads your table with good things and your cup is overflowing with blessings, Rejoice in him more than them. Don't forget that the Lord your shepherd is better than the green pastures and the still waters. And rejoice not in the pastures or in the waters in comparison with your joy in the shepherd who gives you all. So let us love God first and rejoice in the Lord always when the day is brightest and he has blessed us immensely. Rejoice in the Lord always. That is when you are with others. Then rejoice in the Lord. Don't be ashamed to let others see that you're glad. Rejoice in the Lord also when you're alone. I suspect there may be some of you, maybe after the Sabbath hours, after the feast, you've had a blessed time, and you go away from the Lord's table with the very flavor of heaven in your mouths. And then some of you have to go home where everything is against you. The husband doesn't receive you with joy, or the father does not welcome you with any fellowship in your delight. Still rejoice in the Lord always. When you cannot get anybody else to rejoice with you, continue to rejoice. There's a way of looking at everything which will show you that the blackest cloud has a silver lining. There's a way of looking at all things in the light of God. Now I want to finish with the fourth part of this verse, which is the emphasis laid on the command. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let's try it again. Rejoice. I, gotta, I think everybody needs to come up or stand, stand up and do five jumping jacks. Everybody's laughing. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Amen. What does that mean, again, I say rejoice? This was first to show Paul's love for the Philippians. He wanted them to be happy. They'd been so kind to him, and they made him so happy. It's almost as if Paul said, oh, dear brethren, do rejoice. Dear sisters, do rejoice. I say it twice over to you. Be happy. Be happy because I love you so much, but I'm anxious to have you beyond all things else to rejoice in the Lord always. I also think that perhaps he said it twice over to suggest the difficulty of continual joy. You don't have to answer this question. I already know the answer. Have any of you mastered the art of being joyful all the time? I got a hand over here. Praise God. Which is? Amen. All right, we got to go get counseling with this guy after we're done here. <laughs> Micah 7 8. Micah 7 8. It's not so easy for some of us to always rejoice. 
I think for the younger people who are strong in their bodies and have few aches and pains and none of the infirmities of life, it may be an easier thing for you guys. But there are some of God's people who need great grace if they are to rejoice in the Lord always. We Christians in America, I believe, have it really easy. No one is pointing a gun at our head and telling us to renounce our faith or die. America, is it crumbling and becoming anti-Christian? Absolutely. And I think Canada too, fair enough. Do our problems match those of the martyrs before us? Not yet. Not yet. No, times will get harder in the future. The Bible tells us so, but for today, we should be able to count our blessings. If we can count our blessings today, when those times come, we'll be able to count our blessings then. For those in the world who are facing the cruelest of persecution, which the Apostle Paul knew would happen both in his day and in the future, he said, again, I say rejoice. He, repeat, he repeats the precept. And it's as if he was saying, I know it's a difficult thing. And so I more earnestly press it upon you. Again, I say rejoice. I think, too, that he said it twice over to assert the possibility of it. It's as if he was saying, I told you to rejoice in the Lord always. You opened your eyes and look with astonish astonishment upon me, but again, I say rejoice. It's possible. It's practical. I have not spoken unwisely. I have not told you to do what you can never can do. I deliberately write it down again. Again, I say rejoice. You can be happy. God's Spirit can lift you above the down draggings of the flesh and of the world and of the devil, and you may be enabled to live upon the mount of God beneath the shining of his face. Again, I say rejoice. Now, some of you will say, I don't think it matters much, really, if I'm happy or not. I'll get to heaven however gloomy I am, if I'm sincere. No, says Paul. That kind of talk will not do. I cannot have you speak like that. Come, I must have you rejoice. I really conceive it to be a Christian's bounden duty. And so, again, I say rejoice. But do you think also that Paul may have repeated the command to allow for special personal testimony? He might have even said something like this. Again, I say rejoice. I, Paul, a sufferer to the utmost extent for Christ's sake, even now an ambassador in bonds, shut up in a dungeon, I say to you, rejoice. Paul was a greatly tested man, but he was a greatly blessed man. Was he happy all the time? I don't know. But he, I'm just drawing a blank on the verse. Help me, people. The verse where he says, I found it, I'm content in all things. Okay, thank you. You want to say that for us, Andrew? Did you hear it? He's got his headphones in. Anybody know the verse? Philippians 4.11, I guess we're already close to that. Okay, Philippians 4.11. Spiritual gifts, page 260 and 261. Young friends, many of you are sadly deceived. You've been satisfied with something short of a pure and undefiled religion. I want to arouse you. I want to stop just a moment before I finish this quote. As Adventists, I know there's some not Adventists, have you ever heard people say, Ellen White is just doom and gloom? Have you ever heard that? We, I, I have. I've heard that. Oh, she's just so rough and so mean, and oh, she doesn't want us to have any fun. I'm not saying fun in the world sense. She has so much to say about being happy and joyous. Anyway, continuing on. The angels of God are trying to arouse you. Oh, that the important truths in the Word of God may arouse you to a sense of your danger and lead you to a thorough examination of yourself. Your heart is yet carnal. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. This carnal heart must be changed. And you see such beauty and holiness that you will pant after it as the heart panteth after the water brooks. Then you will love God and love his law. Then the yoke of Christ will be easy and his burden light. Although you have trials, yet these trials, well born, only make the way more precious. The immortal inheritance is for the self-denying Christian. 
I saw that the Christian should not set too high a value nor depend too much upon a happy flight of feeling. These feelings are not always true. I saw that it should be the study of every Christian to serve God from what? Principle. Principle and not be ruled by feeling. So is joy a feeling or is it a principle? It's a principle. Amen. By doing so, faith will be brought into exercise and will increase. I was shown that if the Christian lives a humble, self-sacrificing life to God, peace and joy in the Lord will be the result. Does anybody want peace and joy? Yes. I hope so. But the greatest happiness experience will be in doing others good, in making others happy. Such happiness will be lasting. Well, let's sum this up. Point number one, rejoice. Have joy. We serve an all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent king of the universe who knows everything about you and loves you anyway. God is love. The sphere is in the Lord. There is no joy that will last or satisfy unless it is in the Lord. The world wants to deceive you. Keep your moral compass pointed directly to the only one who can bring true happiness and joy. Number three, when does it start? When does always start? Now. now. Oh, by the way, when does it end? Never. Never. Praise God. And number four, again, I, re I say rejoice. Keep it up. Life is hard. Make the choice to have joy. Make the choice to connect to the joy giver. That is the only way we can truly count it all my joy, brethren, when you fall into diverse temptations. Is there any circumstance that we can't have joy? Huh? No. If we backslide, if we're not walking in the Lord, in that ring, in that sphere, God can give us joy so much that our cup runneth over, no matter what the circumstances are. Not only is joy a promise, but remember, it is also what? A command. Did you ever think of it that way? He doesn't give us the option. He says, rejoice in the Lord. There's no if you're feeling like it. If we claim to be followers of Yeshua, then we have no other choice but to believe that he can give us joy today and that he expects us to have joy and to start living that joyful life today. So I would suggest you encourage one another with these words and come alongside others and through our example because we have the joy of the Lord in us, it's pretty contagious. What happens when the cup runs over? It overflows. Where does it overflow to? Wherever we're around. That reminds me, just a little illustration. I wasn't planning to do this. And imagine, you're going to have to use your imagination here. I've got a cup of milk right here, sitting here, and it is filled to the rim, almost like overflowing, but not quite. Sitting on there, what happens if I come up and I do that? Okay. What spilled out? Milk, right? Pretty obvious. So whatever we're filled with, when that trial comes, is going to spill out. If we're filled with the world, the world's going to spill out. If we're filled with the Lord and his joy, that joy is going to spill out. So it's my prayer that each one of us will have the joy of the Lord. So let's stand together. If it is your desire to have joy all the time because we're commanded to do so, let's stand and have, have a word of prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, first I want to thank you just for who you are. You are our joy. And Lord, I ask, I can't speak for anybody else, but I ask for forgiveness when I've not been joyful. Um, when I have let trials take me down. Um, when I let the, the milk of the world spill out of my cup because I haven't been in your word and in your presence. And I pray that each one of us would be so filled with joy that others will see it like the candle in the dark room. May we be the Bible that others read wherever we are, with our family, friends, acquaintances, coworkers, whatever it may be. We thank you for 
the command to be joyful. What a God. You command us to be happy. Thank you, Father. And we ask all this in your son's name, Yeshua. Amen. All right. Thank you, everybody.